Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the challenges and opportunities associated with investing on the continent. This week, we travel to the landlocked country of Rwanda as we take a closer look at the opportunities and challenges that continue to plague this East African nation as it tries to rebuild its image with the global economy. Situated in central eastern Africa and spanning just over 26,000 square kilometers, Rwanda is one of the continent's fastest growing economies as it continues its road to recovery from the civil war and scourge of genocide in the mid-1990s. In spite of global uncertainties, Rwanda's GDP gained 8.8% .8 in 2011 from 7.6% in 2010. This was mainly due to improved harvest, rising exports and increased credit extensions to the private sector. This, however, is expected to drop back slightly to 7.6% in 2012 due to fiscal consolidations. Rwanda exports some of its food harvests in the East African community, but the high cost of trade needs to be urgently addressed. A recent study revealed that the cost of exporting from the country is at times threefold more than in other regional economies. To transport a container of goods from a port, a Kenyan exporter would pay roughly 2,000 US dollars, a Ugandan exporter close to 2,900 US dollars, a Burundian and a Tanzanian would pay 2,965 and 1,300 US dollars respectively, while an exporter from Rwanda would pay a little over 3,300 US dollars. According to the study, local import costs to Rwanda are also higher due to the country's geographical location. High costs of trade, among other issues, may be partly responsible for the country's trade deficit. But despite these challenges, Rwanda is eager to overcome the limitations of its small landlocked economy by leveraging regional trade through the EAC, aligning its budget and formulating policies that enhance its business environment. And now joining me in studio to take a closer look at Rwanda as an investment destination is Paul Runga. He's the Managing Director, Africa Project Access, Sophia Patel, Partner, m and Practice, Weber Wenzel. And joining us from our bureau in Nairobi is Ali Khan Sachu, CEO of Rich Management. Thank you all so much for joining me. Let's look at Rwanda, obviously they're in focus in terms of our journalist having accumulated some information. Is it on your radar screen at the moment, Sophia? Um, it certainly is on, on, on my radar screen, but um, more interestingly, um, it's on our client's radar screen. Um, um, there's a keen interest in Africa generally, but Rwanda has been um, focused uh, by many of our clients looking at investing in, in Africa. As we said earlier, Ali Khan recently celebrated as the third African country in terms of ease of doing business. It's ranked number three when it comes to the African continent. What examples could we take from what Rwanda has done right and deploy those into other territories on the African continent? Um, I think the first thing that Rwanda's done is it's run its economy on an empirical basis. And you can see that in the ease of doing business indices where it just shot up the rankings it takes about 48 hours to open a business in Kigali compared to over a month in Nairobi. And I think President Kagame has embraced a, a very scientific approach to running his government, very output driven, very measured, and, and had tremendous success with it. I mean, people do tend to forget that the genocide only happened 18 years ago. So I think they've come an incredibly long way. Your, your piece, your package was talking about it being landlocked, the challenges about shipping containers into Kigali. They've got plenty of challenges, but I think they've really been able to surmount them by having a single vision and a very clear concept of what defines the national interest. And that lack of definition, I think, is missing in many other African countries to their detriment. Looking, Paul, at the annual growth rate, that's 7 to almost 8%, is it really sustainable? Because this could be the most exciting story on the African continent. Yes, it, uh, I, I'm very optimistic on, on Rwanda because uh, what I do for my clients is I run around chasing projects and trying to identify greenfields and brownfields projects. And there is such a pipeline of projects in Rwanda that 
Yes, on the project's level for sure it's, it's going to be sustained. And also with your, your lead up piece as well, there was a lot of reference to the difficulties in logistics. And that is a very big issue, but bear in mind that with Rwanda and Burundi now joining the East African community and the Isaka Kigali line coming about, and there's a lot of collaboration within the East African region. Absolutely, they now have direct access to the port Mombasa I, I, in Kenya. And the central corridor through to Dar, when that Dar uh, Kigali, Isaka Kigali um, line is, is done. It's a major undertaking, rail line. Um, but that it's going to free itself up and it's fast tracking itself uh, through, through applications of ICT. Uh, very, very much. ICT, I think the, the government is relying a lot on that. There's 2,500 k's of, of fiber optic cable being laid, and it's, uh, it's, it's just appointed as third mobile operator. So it is, it is uh, really, really um, using it. In services, not just products, in services too, like education, health. Uh, in fact, looking at the, just preparing for this and looking at the different sectors, it's amazing the range of sectors uh, in, which are covered by these, these upcoming Greenfields, Brownfields projects. <laughs> Talking about sectors, Sophia, which do you deem to be the hot spots in terms of sectors within the Rwandan economy? Um, uh, I, I do agree with, uh, with Paul that um, ICT is, uh, appears to be a hot spot um, and we've got particular interest, uh, particularly from Indian markets in relation to ICT and other services sectors like health. Um, and I think those are particular hot spots. And I think that's where the strength of the growth in the economy in Rwanda probably lies. Ali Khan, a moment ago, Paul mentioned the East African community. Do you think that we can attribute much of Rwanda's success to the fact that the East African community is working so well? Well, I, I think the East African community is working well. It's the second fastest uh, region, fastest growing region in the world after ASEAN. Um, there is plenty of momentum. I think we're starting from a very low base. So I'd, I'd encourage your viewers to think that this is just the starting point. It's nowhere, it's not a mature move at all. It's a very immature move and I think there's plenty to play for. I think Rwanda, you know, doesn't have the natural resources some of its neighbors have. And I think that's focused their mind more on human capital, in, in creating an environment where people will find it attractive to come with their talents and uh, set up base. And I think those are, are the prime movers behind the Rwandan story. And I, would, I don't underestimate the power of pull. I think President Kagame has an outside share of voice. And part of his, his share of voice is bringing traction to the, these areas like ICT, Carnegie Mellon is setting up shop in Kigali, which in itself speaks to the power of pull in Rwanda. In terms of South African corporates now migrating to the Rwanda space, are there well-known names, well-known brands that are, are going into Rwanda as an entry point? It is still um, a problem in that regard because I don't believe that the profile is of the South Africans present there is, is what it should be. Um, you know, a, a very important factor that South Africans should bear in mind is that Rwanda is now an officially a bilingual country. It, it is not just a francophone country, and that's often been a barrier. In practical terms, as I deal you know, with business development managers and export managers all the time, um, I, I often find this a barrier. They immediately assume, well, the systems are going to be different apart from the language. And, uh, and I went into the, in, uh, the investment promotion center in Kigali not so long ago, and I, I speak good French, so I addressed them in French. And immediately the lady answered me and said, excuse me, sir, but I don't speak uh, French, I speak English. And, um, and uh, you know, so there you go, there's, a, there's an anecdotal evidence of, of what I'm talking about. In terms of the challenges yeah. still facing Rwanda, there are still many. What would you say is the biggest one, Sophia? Um, I, I think um, the, the, probably the biggest problem um, was identified in your piece, and that in, is in relation to export costs. Um, I think that's probably the, the biggest challenges. Uh, I'm very pleased about the, the policy reforms that we've seen since 2001. That's been extremely encouraging. Um, and in fact, um, that has motivated many foreign investors to look at the country as, a, as, a foreign, as an investment destination. Well, let's go back to that third easiest place to do business on the African continent. And Ali Khan, I'm coming back to you. How have they managed to eliminate corruption or is there still a little smidgen of corruption in the system? That, that's a very interesting question, and let me answer it like this. I think you'll never find corruption on an individual basis in the manner you'd find in other parts of East Africa. 
you know, the Kitu Kudogo culture, which is just give me something to make this thing happen. And uh, you find that in everyday life uh, in other parts of East Africa, uh, whereas you will not find that in Rwanda. However, I think, you know, the Rwandan government has essentially created a vehicle which is a party vehicle, which is an investor in many parts of the economy. And I would not define that as corrupt, but I would say that's the system that they've utilized. I think it's quite similar to what the Singaporeans did. You know, you create a very strong institution which is able to, uh, to tilt the pitch a little bit in its favor. But I think, you know, it is extremely clean. My personal impression, I was there uh, 11 months ago. You know, it's a joy to operate there. If you've got an issue, you, you, people will hold their meetings on time. They'll facilitate you. And their success is bound up in yours because they are a small country and they want to be successful. And they can't afford, you know, anyone to go back and say, we were not helpful, you can't do business there. They have a real can-do attitude, which some of the bigger boys around our continent really don't have. Well, we've got Sophia and Paul both nodding furiously in studio to your comments there. Sophia, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to say about the issue of corruption. I mean, that's uh, what, what is really encouraging about uh, the president is, although he's a controversial figure, he's asserted the rule of law in relation to corruption, and he's asserted it quite aggressively. Uh, I mean, to the point where ministers have been locked up. Uh, for corruption, but on that's the basis exactly of what you want to see. People absolutely. really taking it seriously mm -hmm. and taking the necessary action absolutely. when people are found guilty of corruption. Mm -hmm. isn't absolutely, it? Mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and Paul, uh, further to your comments on this. Yes, I just uh, would like to just put in uh, a couple of other elements here because I, I agree 100. percent It's a very comfortable place to do business, um, and, and and the institutions are very helpful. Uh, certainly the investment promotion center very efficient but remember that uh, remember its geographic position it's actually sitting in a very very difficult part of africa mm. you know we've got the eastern drc there and that's never really uh, calmed down so there are wheels within wheels there and um i think a massive return of of refugees from uh, from from the eastern congo in in great numbers would upset things somewhat uh, i think that paul kagami is a very astute politician and he has to play that, but he's sitting on a, next to a cauldron, and uh, it's, it's not all easy. So I think it has to be very strongly controlled. We're going to a quick commercial break. More on Rwanda as a business and investment destination when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Invest Africa. The IMF's decision to ease restriction on Rwanda's borrowing capacity has served the country well. Not only will it give the country access to foreign capital, but it will also allow the country to fund the much needed infrastructure projects in order to compete with the rest of the world. Let's take a look. Today, Rwanda is a very different picture when compared to that some 18 years ago. The city of Kigali is seeing a building boom, and this has been made possible by the influx of investors who are finding the business environment favorable. Rwanda has implemented 22 new regulatory reforms, one of which includes streamlining procedures for registering and starting a business. Whereas a few years ago, one would need to submit at least 10 different documents from different institutions. Now registration can be done online, which has increased the number of small and medium enterprises that are registering their businesses. Robert Futter is a director at a project management company that implements large-scale infrastructure projects in emerging economies. He knows all too well some of the reasons that countries continue to lag behind. Every dot I and T needs to be in place before we'll even move, whereas they will make things happen, which you know, in, in, in Africa, need, things need to happen quickly because we can't wait for 10 years. For the private sector that is still emerging, strategic investments by government are necessary to facilitate private investment development. I think the problem you have in many cases is uh, maybe not so policy so much, but also uh, government will. Uh, we have a good example of a, a large sh a sugar company who's investing in West Africa. Um, part of the project was they were going to build the, the mill and government needed to put in place the infrastructure and the commercial farmers. 
So now they've done all their bit, they've raised finance, they've designed the plant, but the government's now are doing the, the fast shuffle and saying, well, actually, we don't have any money to do this now. If they'd said that on day one, the sugar company might have looked at this in a different way. Taking the lead in large-scale infrastructure projects is the Isaka Railway project, with an estimated investment of 3.7 billion US dollars. This will aim to connect Rwanda with the neighboring country Burundi. And another project in the wings is the construction of the Bugisera International Airport. This is also aimed at attracting investors to partner with the government to finance an estimated 635 million US dollar venture. Because governments haven't got very much money. No government's got enough money to do everything it wants to do. So governments need to leverage that private sector money and get it to do other things for it. Because you know, governments want to build hospitals and schools and look after health and those sort of things. And that's a priority. Rwanda's vision 2020 paves the roadmap for the country's future. This policy will not only aim for greater integration between Rwanda and the rest of the world, but will spur the nation's well-being and fast-track the country's economy. Dimitri Mahanyele, Johannesburg. Paul, just before the, bro the break, you spoke about the, the challenges with associated territories surrounding Rwanda. On the eastern side, yes. On the eastern side. Mm. In terms of the government now within Rwanda and the private sector, what kind of relationship are we seeing? We've obviously spoken about Kagame and his government mm. doing all the right things, weeding out corruption, mm. but are we seeing uh, in terms of closer advancement or closer working with private sector and government? Yes, definitely. It, it, it's very much a partnership approach and it's resulting in uh, quite a few um, substantial investments. I mean, apart from the, the projects that were mentioned there, there's also a major pharmaceuticals uh, plant that's going up. In other words, the, the amount of, of times, the number of times I can put industrial in the, in, in the templates, the project templates, is quite gratifying because that's the value add, that's what, what Africa really needs and that's what Rwanda needs. So there's, there's several, um, there's health laboratories, for example. There's a whole lot of manifestations of of, of innovative projects that would only come about through a, a healthy relationship between government and, and, and the private sector. Ali Khan, do you think they'll manage to go beyond that 7 to 8 percent GDP growth if they continue with the current momentum we're seeing in the economy? I, I think so, definitely. I think they're going to hit double digits in about 24 months. I think this is the, one of the most, well, if not the most well-organized country on the African continent. And, you know, just the organization is worth a number of percentage points. I also think, you know, although it's a very dangerous neighborhood, the Eastern Congo, it remains Rwanda's sphere of influence. And if, if you can get some kind of stability into that area, you should also get a further fillip to GDP. But I think they've got their own momentum. They've got enough of it. And I think they're well organized enough to take this to the next level. And that, I think that's their ambition. Is Rwanda taken seriously by the East African community? In other words, do the other players in that territory see benefits of doing business with Rwanda? I, I think so. I, I think just as Ali Khan has pointed out, uh, the East African community, um, the country surrounding Rwanda, people coming into the East African community all recognize Rwanda as a very favorable and pleasing destination to, to conduct business in. Ali Khan, I'm going to throw it back to you in terms of the number one challenge you think that the Rwandans are faced with at this point. I, I think the number one challenge, besides the logistical one, which we've already discussed, is really about human capital. I think, you know, they haven't got the deep pool of, uh, of people that somewhere like Kenya has. But I think in terms, of create, in, in terms of creating the DNA, they're creating the right DNA, the right conditions. You know, you can go and set up shop uh, if you're an East African community citizen without any question in Kigali tomorrow. And I think that's going to be enough to uh, square off what I would call is a near-term human capital deficit. But I'm pretty certain they're, they're, going to, they're going to cover that base very soon. Taking account what Ali Khan is saying there, then there's great support for the entrepreneur and an entrepreneurial culture within yes. Rwanda. Yes, yes. There is very much. But I want to just uh, point out another challenge. Is everywhere in Africa the major issue is power supply, electricity. Mm. Uh, we cannot talk about Rwanda without talking about the Lake Kivu methane project, uh, which is starting to move now. I mean, there's talk of getting it up to 100 megawatts. Uh, in the not too distant future. That methane gas has to be utilized. 
and, um, and, and, and that's, that's very innovative. And I think that uh, there's been some delays. I'm not saying all went smoothly there. If I speak to the people that, that, that went through that project, it was not always smooth sailing. But now there is action, and, uh, and I think that's a key project. So power, power supply is a Will is that a solve the power supply issues down no, the line? Not at 100 megawatts, uh, no, but it certainly will alleviate. It, 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 it's an inherent. There's also the Rusumu hydropower plant uh, on the Tanzanian border. Um, and that's Again, it's the East African community exactly. relationship that they're harnessing Exa here. Exactly. Um, they cannot do that project without collaboration with Tanzania. So, and, and in Tanzania itself, I sense a lot of prioritization of Rwanda to answer your earlier question. I, I was just going to add that, um, uh, you know, for all accounts, the Rwandan government plans to increase power capacity by 10 times by 2017. Um, and with the will that they've already shown, uh, it's likely that they may actually do that. And it's, it's not a challenge that we in South Africa don't face, the issue of power supply. Ali Khan, uh, now we've spoken about all the good things that Paul Gagami is doing and his government, obviously. What happens in the next election? Is there political risk here? That's a very interesting question. And I think because he's such a totemic figure um, and he's so charismatic and, and so associated with his government, I think clearly it creates some kind of risk and of course, if you know the history of Rwanda, the genocide, uh, the, uh, the whole situation behind it, I think one would have to be naive not to think there is a political risk in that handover when it does come. But I would like to think that they have done enough, that they continue to run ahead of the curve, and eventually that they will put themselves in a position to handle that properly and correctly. But, you know, you are quite right, Bronwyn, you know, uh, there is a lot of political risk around in Africa, and that's exact, exactly the rub of the political risk in Rwanda. But I, I'm convinced from meeting his people, meeting his government, and they're very accessible. If you're looking to invest in Kigali, they will reach out to you as well in a way you'll never find anywhere else. And when you look at the class of people in that group, you've got to be quite confident that they're going to manage this process. Often associated with discussions around countries on the African continent, the beneficiation story comes up. How do we harness our raw goods and materials mm -hmm. and translate them into products and benefit from the end price? Is Rwanda doing that? Uh, another uh, sector we have, we have omitted up to now is agriculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are building, for example, a, they're establishing now a major wholesale food and flour market which will be, have a regional uh, connotation. It will be a, 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 of regional importance. So um, there, there is, there's, uh, for example, a cassava flour milling plant that's going up. Uh, there's plenty of evidence of this beneficiation of, it, look, it has limited resources as a small country. Uh, but even and they've still got the power issue to deal with And they've got well. the power issue to deal with, uh, et cetera. But, um, but I mean, there, there, there are enough value added projects to make it very interesting. Uh, from that point of view, and it's attracting investors. I mean, the, the, the pharmaceutical plant is, it's Indian investors that are involved with that. Are we going to see, uh, earlier in the discussion, we said there weren't enough South African brands in Rwanda. Do you think now with the visibility that Rwanda is getting from the, uh, the report in terms of ease of doing business in Africa, et cetera, we're going to see South African brands really making a charge for Rwanda? I, I think so. In fact, I'm aware of some large um, South African infrastructure companies that are looking to Rwanda um, in relation to the infrastructure projects that are going up there. Um, and they are keenly looking at those projects and considering tendering for those projects. Um, so I think we're going to see some traction there. Uh, further to that question, Ali Khan, do you think we're going to see FDI in general picking up into Rwanda? Absolutely. And I think what is most attractive about it is eventually we're going to get a single community with single community rules in the East African, uh, in the EAC. We're not there yet, we're a long way away from it. But I think that's going to happen pretty rapidly, sp particularly in places like the financial sector, where I think you'll see an equalization across the region. And then I think Rwanda's really going to come to the fore. It's going to prove a very attractive destination from which to, to play within the East African community. And I think that's what Kagame's end game is within the community. And I think some of our bigger, the bigger brothers within the community are napping at the moment and not truly understanding uh, the disjunctive risk that someone like Rwanda might present to uh, vast swathes of their uh, businesses, 
particularly the stockbrokers, for example, and, and, and others. Paul, how are you going to help people in terms of doing business in Rwanda, if we really go on the ground now? Well, uh, there you've just put your finger on it, on the ground. The, the only way that I can get and sensitize uh, our companies to these benefits is to go there myself, come back and, and, and literally dangle the opportunities under their noses. Um, there is still some reticence. And, and another thing that I find amazing, I'm not talking, I'm generalizing, but the lack of knowledge, lack of basic knowledge of the region, mm. um, that is a constant problem. It's, it's a black hole. Mm. It's, it, it's, it's, it's especially in South Africa. Um, I, I think still our knowledge of, the, of African geography needs to be improved um, at that level, you know, export manager level. And I constantly uh, have, you know, awkward questions, uh, well, naive questions about it. And sensitization is what's going to be needed. Well, let's hope that this goes to uncovering the Rwandan story, certainly deserving of more discussion later in this show. We've come to the end of this week's edition of Invest Africa. We'll be back again same time, and that's, of course, next week. Until then, from me, Bronwyn Nielsen, and my guests, it's goodbye.